against all the odds. And we made a decision over the weekend that while this presidential race for us is over for me, and we will suspend our campaign effective today, we are not done fighting. Ms. Pensel on April the 10th announcing the end to his race for the White House. And here from Karen Pensel, joining me now exclusively, welcome to you both. So there's a mixture here, I should say, of disappointment that is packed away. And yet I can see on Karen's beaming smile, thank God I've got my husband back. I mean, there must be a bit of that, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. It's great to have him back. It's nice to be switching gears and get family life back and have some more perspective with the way things should be. It was great, right though. We had so much fun. It was. It was a fantastic was campaign. Amazing. I mean, you came from there. When I remember in December... All the talk. Every time I interviewed you, it was almost like, what do you get now? Huh? Why are you doing this? What do you get now? Yeah, well, what are you doing what this are you for? Doing? You yeah. crazy man. Yeah. You're on 2%. Yeah. And then Iowa happened, and boom. Suddenly, it all changed. And for you, an incredibly exciting run, even though it came to an end on April the 10th. Well, for us, it wasn't suddenly. I mean, we've been you know, out there working in the vineyards for over a year, and really just uh, hitting the ground in three states by then. Yeah, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. And when it was all said and done, we... We've done 385 town hall meetings in the state of Iowa. So when people say, boom, you just arrived on the scene, well, you know, well let, me, let, me, let me have you walk a few miles in my moccasins. I mean, we were well, out I there working hard. How many places in Iowa? 385 town hall meetings, all 99 counties. And that was incredible. It I was, remember, I remember it thinking, this great. guy, it was great. he's putting the yard in. Yeah. You know, you can't deny it. And her, too. I mean, we had the family out there for the uh, Iowa straw poll. We, uh, they came out for about three weeks. And... I did a little, our, actually our summer vacation was last year. Uh, we, we spent it at, at uh, Stephen Jan, Jan, Jan Boondu's farm in uh, Oskaloosa, <laughs> Iowa. Uh, and just had a wonderful time with the, just the great people there in the state of Iowa. And we always have a, small, a very, very, uh, very soft place in our heart for them. It's great there. How bittersweet was it to be in my green room here watching Mitt Romney making what was effectively the nominee stand for the three incumbent presidents? Well, I, and I thought it was a good speech. Uh, he, he set the right tone. Tone was uh, this race is about Barack Obama and his failures. This is uh, he's got an optimistic vision for the country, uh, and uh, I'm very glad to see that. I think he uh, he painted a, a strong picture, and uh, it's one that uh, is a very clear contrast to what this president has brought this country. Absolutely. But I'm hearing here, Rick. I mean, for the last few months as I've interviewed you, Mitt Romney's been the biggest danger to the American civilization <laughs> imaginable. I think that's well, over- I think that's overstatement just <laughs> a little bit. I think I've been pretty clear about who the greatest danger is. How hard is it to segue from vicious opponents trying to win a race against him to somebody now sounding very supportive? Well, my, my feeling is that the objective is to get this country back on the right track on a variety of different fronts, and that's what the race was about. It's always been about that, and uh, we felt we were the best person to do that, and uh, we went out and made the case and uh, talked about a lot of issues that weren't getting a lot of airtime, and I think uh, to the benefit. And I, I, in hearing Governor Romney and some of the speeches, I was in St. Louis at the NRA and uh, listened to his speech on freedom and heard a lot of familiar refrains, which I was actually pleased to hear. Uh, you know, I- imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And so when I hear a familiar uh, line coming uh, from another uh, candidate, that makes me feel like maybe we had an impact on this. Everyone's watching tonight, once they knew you were appearing, wondering, well, come on then, if you like him so much suddenly, <laughs> are you going to endorse him? Uh, well, you know, we're going to be meeting with Governor Romney. We're, our staffs have been putting, uh, trying to put something together. I'm going to be meeting with some of his people after tomorrow uh, to talk about some things. And then uh, Karen and I will have an opportunity to meet with the governor, hopefully, in the next uh, week or two. And as you can imagine, the last couple of weeks we've been trying to decompress a little bit, spend a little time with our family. And I uh, really haven't had uh, a whole lot, as you say, I've been out doing a lot of media, talking to a lot of folks. We've been trying to just get uh, get my bills paid, get my get well, my When, you, when you see the governor, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it all worked out with you. Having scrapped away with him, you now sit down in a darkened room, get rid of the advisors, and you say, right, I need some cash to pay off my debts. Yeah. I'd like a nice cabinet post. Isn't no. that how this works? No. Yeah, we're not doing that. No, no, that's not, that's not what this is about. I mean, uh, this is about winning the election, uh, making sure that we have the right person uh, in the presidency, in the House, and in the Senate. So you believe that Mitt Romney's the right guy? I believe he's the better. It was obviously, I believe that was the better choice. But that, I'm not in this race. But anymore, he's won so the race. He's won the race. Is he therefore the right guy? Yeah, absolutely. He's he's the he's the person that uh, uh, that is going to go up against Barack Obama. It's pretty clear. And uh, we we need to win this race. We I mean, need that's to beat an Barack Obama. Well, isn't it? Yes, I'm mishearing things. Well, 
You just endorse Mitt Romney. Well, if that's what you want to call it, you can call it whatever you want. I, I, Am I listen, wrong? I, all I would say, look, I believe we Karen, need, you know your we husband. Need to win the race. He, has he just endorsed Mitt Romney? Not at this point. <laughs> no, we're, we're working through it. We're talking about I'm not, it. I may be naive when he is to the American political system, when but when somebody <laughs> says, yes, I think he's the right guy for the job, he's, he's, it sounds to me like an endorsement. It's very clear that he's going to be the Republican nominee, and I'm going to be for the Republican nominee, and, I'm, and we're going to do everything we can to defeat Barack Obama. How much of a problem has it been for him that you pushed him, whether he wanted to or not, to go much more right wing, perhaps, but certainly on social issues than he may have wished to. And he's now going to have to probably rein back in from some of those positions that he took to compete with you. Now he's competing with Barack Obama. Well, I don't think the issues that, uh, that, I, that we brought to the case, uh, the, the race were, were right wing. I mean, we, we talked about the importance of, of family and, and the family unit and fathers being involved in raising their children and the integrity of that family unit being vitally important for our economy. I mean, that was really the, if you want to talk about something new that we brought to the argument, we talked about the importance of, uh, of two-parent families in a strong and vibrant economy, that the poverty rate is five times higher among single-parent families, and that we have, unfortunately, government programs that, you know, create a, uh, a dependency on government and, and, in many cases, undermine the American family. And, and I was in the... Do, does part of you regret, maybe both of you, actually, on this, that... The debate became very loudly about abortion, gay marriage, issues like that, contraception. That was all anybody was talking about. And it became, you became that go-to guy <laughs> for the, I hate this, I hate that, I hate this. You know, you became Nanny Santora. Do well, you regret that that became the way you were perceived? Did it harm your chances of winning the nomination? You know, it's so funny. I would go out and give a talk, and, uh, you know, because I did town hall meetings. And, you know, 385 in Iowa, but I did them all over the country for a long time. And, uh, you know, I'd ask, I'd, I'd open up for questions. We didn't have, as you know, I mean, we didn't do, you know, we didn't push with the crowd. We were lucky anybody showed up. And so we'd get every question. And, you know, the, the reporters would always come back and, you know, I'd, I'd give a speech on freedom and uh, opportunity and uh, manufacturing jobs and, and uh, balanced budget amendments and, and the integrity and importance of the American family. And someone would ask me a question about a variety of these issues and sort of spend some of these suggestions. And the reporter would go back, oh, here's Stan Trump talking about these issues again. Well, I talked about all the issues. And maybe that made me different than everybody because I didn't have a structured forum. I, I went out there and, and dealt with people as they came and listened to the voices of the American public and what they were concerned about. And I felt an obligation to answer straight up. I mean, I know that uh, that sometimes gets you in trouble. A lot of, a lot of folks uh, in, in political life pivot when they get those questions. <laughs> and I'm not, uh, you know, I was a center in basketball. I was, you know, I, that was the pivot position, but I wasn't very good at it. I, I, mean, went, Karen, I went straight to the basket every time. Your husband isn't a natural pivoter. I mean, and I always gave him great credit, even when I didn't agree with some of the things he was saying. And I'm a fellow Catholic. Even when I didn't, I respected the fact that they clearly were from a position of conviction and belief, which I didn't always feel about some of the other candidates. Are you proud of the way that he fought his campaign? I'm so proud of him. He did an amazing job. It was amazing what we did. And what I love is that Rick answers the questions. If you notice people in interviews, frequently they won't answer the questions. And, you know, Rick talked about a lot of issues in his joint. It was national security, jobs in the economy, and, and health care, and things that matter to people. And what amazed me is I would sit in on these town hall meetings, and I was at a lot of rallies, and then they would report, and they would pigeonhole him into thinking that he only talked about the social issues, which wasn't true. And I would think, wow, were they at the same event? <laughs> you know, because it was not just the only thing he talked about. On that thought, when we come back, I want to talk to you about the highs and lows of the campaign. Well, I've got a few lows I want to toss on the fire. Of course you do. Uh, but there are some great highs as well. Let's explore them after the break. Of course you do. <laughs> I do have concerns about women in frontline combat. President Obama once said, said he wants everybody in America to go to college. What a snob. But, I mean, that's good. Between Rick and Karen Santorum, my two, greatest hits. Two of your greatest hits. Well, let's not say hits, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> of all those, which is the one you most regret looking back? Uh, Just casually. Well, the, the, the snob one because uh, I misread 
his comment, you know, I, I, I thought he said everybody should go to college, and it was, it was what I had read was someone's interpretation of what, it, and, and I just used that as a fact, and, I, and, and, I, and it, it was factually incorrect. So that's the one I feel bad about. The other ones, you know, I, I could have framed them a little better, but I meant no harm. Karen, when were you, do you remember the moment you were most angry with him for one of his jabs? Oh, it was the Saab comment, and I wish he hadn't said that. And uh, it was just any moment where he wasn't thoughtful or considerate. He was a great guy. He was really friendly. And any time he didn't show that part of himself, it, it was a little frustrating. Well, I'm frustrated. What was he doing? Would you tell the story? Or put him on the phone? Would you, would you no, I won't. Would, <laughs> the, would, the, would the voices get raised? I mean, he seems such a nice, quiet person, yes. really, Karen. But I can imagine there's a yes. steely side when Rick commits a gap. Well, you know how when you're married, you just... You're always there for each other, and you give each other advice. And it was during debates. Um, we had moments, I think especially the one before Michigan, that was a real challenge, that debate. And um, I left early that night. <laughs> yeah. What did you say and to him after that debate? Because that, um, that was not a good performance. It was a preparation issue, and it was just a real, you know, we let I, down. See, I, um, I, listen, I did most of my debates because we were sort of a one-man band out there. And so I didn't take any time off before the debate. I mean, I just campaigned the whole day up until the debate. And Karen on that one said, you know, Rick, you know, you're now, people are going to actually start paying attention to what you're saying as opposed to in, in the past, nobody really paid any attention. Now you're in the game, you just won those three states, and you got you to gotta be a little bit, you know, take a little bit more time. And I just sort of kept it routine. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't as sharp as I should have been, and I did have a right to have some anger. Do you remember moments in the campaign when you had much more serious issues and told them to do them better? Um, and most recently, again, you know, it's not just an ongoing battle you had. Were there moments when that flared up, you know, where both of you or either of you thought, you know what, maybe it's not worth it, mm -hmm. that actually running for president's fine, but we have a, a thick daughter that needs it? It must have been a cost-up for you. For her constantly, as all, with all of our children, and we did have moments like that. However, ballot really was a great source of the reason why we got into the race in the first place. She was the reason uh, that when we learned about when Obamacare went through, I think that was really the fire that put the fire in our belly to get in because it was people, children like Bella, who were going to be on. I think the first kids to be affected by something like that, and um, so. It's of course, there were times when it, the burden seemed so big, and sometimes it felt like maybe it wasn't the right time. I did resist it for a very long time, but in the end, I did feel like it was God's will, and it was the health care, uh, Obamacare, that did how put me in the race. How is she now? She's doing great. Mm. Thank you so much, yeah. Bruce. She's doing I great. I think everyone's been worried about you. smile to draw back. She's been, she's been an amazing uh, component of this campaign. I mean, we, we wanted... Obviously, she's one of our children, and so we had her out there in the sense that you know we had a pic had a family picture she was in, but we didn't talk about Bella very much uh, until uh, she got sick, and I had to come off the campaign trail. I was sitting right prior to the pri uh, Florida primary, and I just lost two primaries in a row, and I, I was home. I happened to be fortunate to be home that day when she ended up in having to take her to the hospital. So we were going to be off the campaign trail for a couple of days, and we had to make the decision. Should we announce why I'm going to be pulling off my schedule a couple of days at a time when people are saying, shouldn't you get out of the race? And if you did pull off, they'd say, oh, he's, he's pulling out. And so we felt like we had to say why we were, uh, why we didn't continue the campaign schedule. And then we sort of had to tell people about Bella in much more detail. And, and so we put a little video together uh, later that week and did some, it, it by far was the most viewed thing in our race. Uh, and she became very much a part of the campaign. And a voice to the voiceless. Yeah, she really she was, was everywhere, special. and it was amazing. And all the rallies and events that we had, the one question we got from literally thousands of people was, yeah. "How's Bella?" Yeah. And well, it's great. It's her. great that she's doing well. I mean, it is. We've all you. been deeply concerned about it. Let's take, let's take another break. When we come back, my Twitter has exploded because uh, Karen said they all believe you have endorsed yeah. Mitt Romney tonight. <laughs> you now have two minutes to work out whether you wish to make that official or whether you want to carry on denying the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Back when we know, talk about one of my favorite topics, keeping America great. Let's turn a 
Better, sir? Yes, sir, did I? I, I <laughs> all I said was the obvious, which is Mitt Romney's going to be the nominee, and I'm going to support the nominee, whoever that nominee is, period. You love Mitt Romney? Well, that's what it looks like, yeah. He's won all five states tonight. He's in Pennsylvania. You're also on the assumption that he is the nominee. I will support the nominee of our party. You just endorse Mitt Romney. Uh, well, I've, uh, that's yeah. nothing new. Well, it's not going to be anybody else, is it? It's well, going to be Ron Paul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Who knows? He's the he's working the delegates real hard. I can tell you. Can that. I make? Can I put it this way? Do I end this debate? If Mitt Romney is the nominee, you will endorse him. If he's the nominee, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that he defeats Barack Obama. Absolutely. I mean, I that's uh, that's that's why I got into this race. You will endorse him. Uh, if if, if <laughs> I, I'm going to support the Republican nominee. You haven't got to be a politician anymore about I'm this. I'm not being a politician. You're an honest, honest straight talker. You'd be boasting I about am, that. I'm being an honest straight talker. Uh, if he's the nominee of the party, I'm going to do everything I can to help him win. Including endorsing him. Absolutely. There we are. That's all I wanted you to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, let's play you a little clip from uh, former Vice President Cheney about the Gulf proceeding in D.C. And I think the single most important criteria has to be you know, the capacity to, to be president. That's what I think. And uh, lots of times in the past, uh, that has not been the case. I mean, bang on, isn't it? And you look at what happened. Absolutely. You know, and that's what I said when I, you know, when I was asked that question um, during the campaign. I said, you know, the first and foremost is petitioner's the capability of keeping the promises that I, I made to the American public and, um, and, and be a good president. Who is the most likely of all the names? I mean, I'm assuming you wouldn't want to be in the running, or would you not rule that out? I, look, I'm, I'm not interested in, in any position. I'm uh, interested in winning the election and if you were Mitt Romney, who, my who would you now? be looking at in a favorable way right now? Uh, that's, I'm not going to comment on that. That's really his, uh, his decision. And, um, Karen, if Mitt Romney rang up and said he wanted to, to be in D.C., what would you say? Oh, I'd have to talk to Rick about it and maybe need a little time to, um, you know, think it over and pray about it and, you know, consider it. I'd be very surprised. <laughs> he's a great guy. But, um, really, on a technical point in relation to Mitt Romney needing a certain number of delegates, will you be releasing more delegates? Uh, I think the way the, the law comports is that once you're not a candidate, your delegates are effectively released. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I think states have been going through the process right now. We've been sort of trying to understand how that works. But this is my first go around on this. Uh, and that is that once you're no longer a candidate, if the state laws really become operative, then a lot of states, they effectively release your delegates, and other states, you, they, you, you hold them irrespective of whether you're in the race or not. What is next for Mr. Trump? What's the next job for you? What would you like to do? Well, we're going to be announcing some things here in the next uh, week or two about uh, what, what, what our plans are. Uh, it's not going to be easy, isn't it? Uh, among sure. friends? Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to be active and engaged in the, in, in the political process. We're going to be active and engaged on the issues that... That, uh, that we brought up during this campaign, some of the things that we talked about tonight. Uh, this, is, um, this is a, like I said in the, uh, in the speech when I got out of the race, uh, we tried to listen very hard to the people across this country, and I think we picked up some tones Karen, that, uh, I want to give you the that need to be resonated. I want to give Karen the last word here, very quickly. We've got about 20 seconds. What was the best thing of the whole campaign? Oh, Iowa. Winning Iowa was great. It was, and I, we walked up on the stage, and I said to the children, Soak it in, enjoy this moment. And every time we got on stage, we said that. It was I agree with you. Thrilling. It's a wonderful moment. We'll always have Iowa. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Great to see you.